Back in 77, when I started this, there was a pigs in a blanket. I didn't want to sort of pigs in a blanket, not with Julia Child sitting on my shelf. So I was upping that. I was enabling the consumer to have something better. If you've ever been at a party and eaten a tiny little quiche, you probably have Nancy Mueller to thank. Her story is remarkable. She went from baking in her home kitchen to creating an order of empire called Nancy's Specialty Foods. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar, and on this episode, we find out what it's like to start and run a multi-million dollar business from the queen of quiche herself. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much for coming on my podcast. I'm so eager to hear all your stories and all your experiences about being the queen of quiche. (laughs) I think it's such an intriguing trajectory that you've had to go from making appetizers and hors d'oeuvres in your kitchen to creating this multi-million dollar business. So I'm curious, did you have a big goal when you started out or did it just kind of evolve step by step by step? Well, you know, when you start out and you're making little petite quiche with your fingers in a mini muffin tin and dipping in a coffee measure 12 times to fill each one of those little tins, <laughs> and then you put three or four in the oven, you just don't know in the beginning. I had a vision that we needed appetizers because I would have these big Christmas parties every year for my husband, who was a venture capitalist with his work colleagues, his partners. We'd invite our friends and 3,000 appetizers later wow. stored in the freezer and babysitters serving them out of the oven. We, you know, we had a party. So yes, I had a vision. I was driving down the street past the high school and my kids were five and eight and I was on the way to playing tennis and I was a horrible tennis player and I just <laughs> made a decision that I wanted to do something that after 10 years, I would have something to show for my time. And another part of my inspiration was, I was a member of the Junior League at the time, and they had us all do a career development module. Mm. And so we had to sit there for two hours and answer all these questions about, would you rather do this or that and so forth. It was a really good exercise. And I came out of that knowing I wanted to be an appetizer maker. I wanted to manufacture appetizers. Specifically appetizers, not just that you wanted to have your own small business or anything. Appetizers. Amazing. The reason was you couldn't get them in the store. It's a pain in the neck to make them if you're short of time. And remember, this was in 1977, a long time ago. And we had just come up with a pill for most women by 77, most women were using it and they were working and they didn't have time for all this. You know, even with little kids, you hardly have time, but certainly if you're working nine to five or nine to eight, whatever. So that was the whole inspiration behind the business was to have something after 10 years to show for my time, to be able to integrate it with my family, my young children and my husband, and I could do it. In 1976, I had a focus group in October and I made a bunch of appetizers and I gave them little cards and I asked my friends to rate these products. Well, it didn't matter what the ranking was because there was really only one that I felt I could mass produce and it was the petite quiche. And it was the flagship product anyway. I mean, it was just a fantastic eating machine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just pick it up and everyone loves it. And it's a finger food. Yeah, and think of it. When finally I had the right equipment, the crust was very thin. The filling was succulent and moist. The browning on the top looked good. You could eat it in two bites without getting your fingers dirty. You know, I had a little napkin and a little tiny bit of buttery grease, but not much. And it worked. It worked big time. You had mentioned earlier that more women in the workplace maybe affected your business in a positive way of people not being able to make hors d'oeuvres, so they would buy hors d'oeuvres. What about the idea of quiche in particular? I know Julia Child had recently come out with her Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Do you think people were just more interested in the idea of French food too in the 70s? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I was one of those. 
I've got two or three copies of her book. <laughs> my mom too. My mom cooked her way through that book. I love it. That's where I learned. I didn't know what quiche was. As a matter of fact, the UPS driver would come up and say, what is this? Quickie? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Quickie. <laughs> quiche. -E -E -S -H, you know? <laughs> so no, people did not know what it was, but Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. Remember that book? Yes, I do. I was sure that that was going to hurt our business. It did not hurt our business. It told the whole world what quiche was. No publicity is bad publicity, <laughs> right? As long as it's publicity. <laughs> so we That's interesting. Time with that. So awareness was the biggest problem in the beginning because nobody really knew what it was. But think of this. Whenever anybody buys a box of petite quiche and they serve it at a party and people say, where did you get this? You now have 12 mouths from that box and plus another 12 or 24 from the other boxes in the kitchen. And everybody then learns about it. The product becomes a massive demo. <laughs> it really <laughs> does speak for itself. Exactly. <laughs> and it was good. I know it was good because it, it tasted good. I, I'm very fussy, but it, it was not just me saying it. It was good. So my original customers were retail stores all the way from Marin County, north of San Francisco, down through San Jose. I would take my Volvo station wagon with a big triple ply corrugated watermelon box that I stuck in the back of it. I cut out doors with the little wooden knobs so I could close and open them, and then the back had a big door too. I'd stop at the foremost dairy on the way out and fill it with dry ice, and I'd stuff that thing full of as many boxes of product as I could, and I would stop at all these little stores along the way, talk to the freezer guy, and say, can I cut these in? And so I did all of that myself for the whole year. Wow. And then I had some food service accounts, a wonderful little guy, Tanaka, brought me orders and picked up product for restaurants and caterers and so forth. Six years later, in 1983, I was a half a million dollars in the red. Oh. I had moved a couple times to bigger shops. There was no problem selling it. The problem was selling it and making the bottom line work. It just because you had employees at this point, you I, couldn't make all this on your own. So oh no, I did it all. Then I hired the high school kids and they were great. And then eventually an Hispanic lady knocked on the door and she said, can I have a job? I want to make some money to have a nice wedding for my daughter. Well, 10 years later, she retired. <laughs> Way past the wedding. She's still working and for you. All the kids and all the talent, all the help. I remember her, she'd stand at the door, checking them out. You smell, go home and shower. Come back when you're, when you're done. <laughs> so she managed this crew. She knew how to take care of them. Mina was wonderful. So that's how we got our people. We had 5, 10, 30, 50, so forth. The business was growing. But still, to the point, we were in red ink. We were in debt because we kept funding it. And that was a lot of money. We were both saying, this is about time. We have to either find a solution or shut the business down because it wasn't tenable. So in 1983, two weeks before Christmas, we sat around the table. Well, what about trying Price Club? They were very new at the time. So we took it to them. They said, we'll take it up the freeway and have it shrink wrapped and bring it back and let us see it. Well, they put it in. They had ordered 25 cases, that was a Thursday, for the following Wednesday. And then we had to build those 25 cases of product. That would service customers for a month. <laughs> yeah, how much would be in a case? There were probably 60, I think, in a case for them. Okay. So um, that next Wednesday, we had 25 cases in each of the four price clubs in Northern California delivered on the floor by nine o'clock. By 11 o'clock, they were all sold out. Wow. Got into a freezer case. They sat on the pallet in the middle of the floor and people just grabbed them and ran. Oh my gosh. They didn't get into the case. There wasn't someone handing out samples or anything. People no. just took them. No, they just, 
needed them. It was Christmas, you know? Wow, look at that. So. <laughs> what a success. We had a monkey by the tail. And I got a call the next day from the Los Angeles Price Club wanting a truckload. I said, well, I can't get a truckload, but next year I will. And next year we had many truckloads going to LA at Christmas time. So just think of it. You know, here we are. There's so many aspects to this, but how did we make those 25 cases? How are we doing all of this delicate finger work? Well, we weren't. Yeah. Because an old guy, Rodney, had walked by the shop. What are you doing in here? Well, we showed him. He said, I can do something to make that work faster for you. He was an engineer from the aerospace business. And he didn't want to make any money because he didn't want to pay any taxes to the government who was running the war in those days. <laughs> so he came in and for $10 an hour, he made all the jigs and the dies and the equipment to semi-automate the process. So if you had been in a bakery, you might wonder how they make their pie crust to fill to make pies. Well, there's a machine called a pie press and the pie press has a die on it. And Rodney made us, first of all, one little die, a plug that would press the dough in those little mini muffin tins. So one at a time, we could press that. And we had a little jig that it would sit in. So when it came up, it was centered. Uh -huh. so it's important. So the crust is even. In the meantime, I had learned that a convection oven was far better than a radiant oven for cooking this product. So I had banks of convection ovens. I had a big walk-in freezer. We would put this stuff on racks, roll it in the freezer. When it's frozen the next morning or that night, whatever, take it out and box it and pack it and da da da, and get ready to put it in the truck. And we had different packagings for food service and retail and Price Club and Trader Joe's by now. Oh, yeah. So we were in business and we had good business. I can't remember in those days, the sales were probably a half a million dollars about that time. Wow. We got into Price Club. I think we were 1.2 million, something like that in sales. And we had had a little profit there earlier on, but it just wasn't steady. It wasn't reliable. Once we got in the price club, we had to drive out of that red ink because two things. One, the pricing that we had for price club was good. It wasn't excessive, but we made money on it. You have to, or you're out of business. Right. The retail product helped to introduce people to it. The retail customer would buy retail product, and then when they saw it at Price Club in a bulk form, 60 instead of 12, of course, that reduces the price because the costs are lower. Mm -hmm. So the product continued to fly out the door. So after that Christmas, they took the petite quiche out. They discontinued it because it's the holidays over, right? Nobody's going to buy an appetizer in January, right? Wrong. About three weeks later, they begged us to put it back in because everybody was clamoring for it. And at the same time, we had put in a small chicken pot pie size quiche frozen. Uh -huh. And that did all right, but it wasn't quite right. So eventually we found a way to make a single serving quiche. So Nancy's quiche, we have the Lorraine and the spinach Florentine. And we have Monterey and Mushroom as well. And these went into retail. And also Price Club took them as well. So we're swimming. We are just going gangbusters. Price Club is growing. So in the beginning, they had like seven stores or eight stores. By now, they've got 40, 50, 60 stores. And we ship to their warehouses. They draw the supply from the warehouses. The kiss of death in this business is to run them out of supply. So we always had more inventory than we thought we needed so that we could always supply them. We had, and I guess you could have that since it was a frozen product. Exactly, exactly. And in the meantime, I think it was 1985, we picked up the Sam's Club business. Sam's Club operates out of Bentonville, Arkansas. Sam's, of course, watches what Price Clubs does. BJ's, a, another warehouse, smaller, 
in the East Coast had had it for a couple of years. Sam's had, I don't know, a couple hundred stores. So I was scared to death that, yes, it would work in Price Club, but would it work in Sam's with their far-flung stores in little towns? Turned out one of the stores in Tennessee was their highest seller. Go figure. You wow. Know, TV that people hear about things that they wouldn't have heard about otherwise. So and good news was traveling fast by that time. Was it a lot of word of mouth or were you getting a lot of press or was it just people like the product and so they're going to buy the product? In the very early days, I called the people at Regis McKenna. Regis McKenna was a man and it was his marketing company uh, because the, the venture guys were using Regis McKenna. Apple came out of Regis McKenna. And so they decided, they heard my story and they said, no, you don't want to buy advertising, which I was doing $18,000 for an ad that ran once in a newspaper, black and white, terrible waste of money. So they recommended doing PR. So I was on TV, radio, newsprint, magazines. That's how Trader Joe's found us from California business. And I was on the cover of it. And they called me up that next day and said, we want to talk to you. And I wow. was all over the country. I was down in Mexico. I was in Japan because we had some business there. I was in Canada. We had business up there. So PR for anybody wanting to get into a specialty business like this is more important than any advertising can do. Don't waste your money. So I had a story about Sam's waiting in the San Jose airport for the rains to stop in Dallas. We finally got off to Dallas from San Jose, and then all the flights were canceled. The whole thing was dead, except I had checked general aviation when I was in San Jose to calibrate, could I charter a flight from San Jose to Bentonville? Well, I couldn't because the weather was so bad. But by the time we got to Dallas, where assessing our options. I said, I'm going to call General Aviation and see if they have a plane. Well, they did have a plane, but she said, it's a challenger. And this is the kind of plane that takes rock stars across <laughs> the pond to Europe. <laughs> I said, well, I only need to go to Bentonville, which is 45 minutes away, $6,000, which it would have cost to charter that plane in San Jose. I got this challenger that Larry, my VP of sales and I <laughs> enjoyed. We had some of their whiskey, we had the <laughs> swag. <laughs> so we got this private plane and we go to our Motel 6. <laughs> Great juxtaposition and there. And this was to get the Sam's business in the beginning. And I had to fly from there to New York and I just sequestered myself. I had a little computer at the time. I think, actually, it wasn't little. I think it was one of those big portable compacts mm -hmm. carried around with me. And I did the spreadsheets. I worked on the SAM. What if we were to sell the SAMs? What would the model be? So forth. What if we had to do demos? We do demos at Price Club once a month in every store. Well, we have to expect to do demos in Sam's Club once a month in every store. That's expensive. Fortunately, it helps move product. So it kind of pays for itself. But if you're not moving product in Ozark County, you know, whatever that store is, it's not going to pay for itself. But it did. And so Sam's really became the bigger account. Even with Price Club being so big, Sam's was bigger than Price Club. How did you have all this business acumen? I know you were a chemist by training originally, but did you just learn a lot of this as you went? as this business grew to be able to run this empire as it was growing, it's really astonishing. Well, I've been, I've always been kind of mechanical. I was the oldest boy of two children in my family. <laughs> I was a girl, but you know, I did the boy stuff with my father and I would come home with a project from Latin class and I want to make a Roman aqueduct and have the water flow and you know, I did things like that. So I've always been very mechanical and enjoy using my hands. Also, because I was a chemist and had an analytical mind, I, I was a problem solver. You have to be a problem solver. You have to start over and look at it a different way and try to figure out how to make it work. 
I also, you know, used the industry. When I bought my first pie making machine, we couldn't keep up with all of the business from Costco. Now Costco, they bought price books, so it becomes uh-huh. Costco. The business was just beyond us. We couldn't produce enough. And certainly for the next holiday season, because we knew that the there were more stores being added, then we were getting into Sam's, blah, blah, blah. So I needed an automated system. And I went to Italy and I almost bought theirs. And thank God I didn't. And I met a woman who had a cheesecake company in San Francisco. And I told her what I was doing. And she said, oh, you don't want to go get the Italian equipment. That stuff's awful. Go to Reichardt in Holland. So in January, on January 27th, I remember the date, I placed the order for that Reichardt machine to be delivered in August. And we would also at the same time have a big pass-through oven, a big convection oven that would bake the product properly, the cooling tunnel so you could handle it after it came out of the oven, a way to depan the quiche, because they're now they're being done in nine across 12 long holes. So multiply that out. Each pan had that many. And that would go through the oven, through the cooling tunnel, big frame to put it in to dump it over and all the little quiches would come out. We would sort them, put them in the trays, put them on another conveyor, going into a spiral freezer. They go up, 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 and then down and into a packing line. Well, what's the point of the spiral freezer? To stay in the chamber longer. The capacity had to be equal at all of these points. So if you could get 20 trays through the oven in 20 minutes or half an hour, you've got to be able to get 20 equal quantity for those trays out of the freezer and everywhere else along the way. It's a whole logistical problem all along the way. Yeah. And then I've got this nitrogen system to do the freezing. It was a nitrogen freezer. So I had big equipment outside. I mean, it was really massive. I guess it was 10,000 square feet. And by now we've got another 10,000 down the street. So then we ended up knowing that we needed more capacity building wise. So we had these two little buildings. We needed a big one. We built an 84,000 square foot, two story facility. And it wasn't just me. I've got a fabulous team. So I built this new building and bought another pie line from Rycart, twice the capacity, twice the speed, double rows of punches instead of a single row of punches. So I could do twice as much. And another freezer for the new facility and another Enersist oven and more conveyors wow. and all of that. So it was huge. And eventually, by the time 1998, 99 came around, we were pumping the quiche directly from the kitchen into the poppers that would then deposit into those little cells. So it was a flow through process, very, very highly automated. I don't know if this is correct, but I I read in my research before interviewing you that in 1995, every day, a million quiche pies in six flavors came out of the plant in Newark. Is that right? Do you think a million a day? Yeah. And by the time we sold the business in 1999, I'm getting ahead of myself. Those machines, they were making all petite quiche could produce a million and a half a day. And they were always running all the time. So that's the way it was. So let me say some things that make a business work. You've got to have fabulous people. You've got to have a fabulous product. It's got to be a product that people tell their friends about whether it's food or whether it's an app or whether it's a pencil you like, whatever. You want to broadcast it. You want to talk about it because you like it, they should too. And you need customers who you can depend on. The problem with the club stores, they're fabulous if you're doing business with them, but the minute they think they can put another product in that is equal to what they have at a slightly lower cost, they will kick you out with Absolutely no apology. Toward the end of 98 and into 99, they were bringing competitors against my quiche weekly. I had three segments of business. The business from Costco, the business from Sam's, and all of the other food service and retail business. And they were equal, a third, a third, a third. 
And Costco and Sam's were both profitable. The retail and food service business was not profitable. Mm. And the only reason I did continue doing it was because, as I alluded to before, by building that retail business, the branded business, was because that would introduce people to the product all over the country. If you put all the stores together, 60% would have it. So it's almost like PR. It was in their grocery store, so they would see it. It, it was a tasting room. <laughs> and then they'd go to the club stores, they'd find it there, and oh, they just put it in their freezer. So I just couldn't sleep. I woke up one night, and I was in a cold sweat. I was scared to death that I would lose one or the other of the club store businesses. And without it, I was barely at break even. And I had... $20 million worth of debt. You know, I had to build that big facility. I had all the equipment in it, paying all this off, but it's not paid off. And so I thought, wow, if something happens, how am I going to recover? Because there's no product number two that can come in. Like Heinz is a $9 billion company. They bought Nancy's in 2006 because I sold the leverage buyout firm. They had it six years and then they sold it to Heinz. And they okay. came in and Heinz bought it. And this is 1% of it. It's very small. So they could afford to take a risk at it. And Heinz bought it because they wanted to add it into their appetizer business. So anyway, I think that's another point in owning a business. It's like in the card game. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. Because if you hold on too long, and I think of GoPro, and I think of Peloton, GoPro, I think, is doing all right. Peloton is not. They should have sold out when they could make some money at it. And, you know, you work too hard. I've, I spent 22 years of my life doing this. Sure, I did a few other things here and there, but it was on my mind 24 hours a day for 22 years. I wasn't tired. I just knew I had to sell to preserve the asset. That was it. So that was the beginning. That was the realization that night of the cold sweats. It's it's time to get out. Yeah, I can't take the chance that a competitor will come against me. And you can't find Nancy's petite quiche in Costco anymore or Price Club. The retail quiche is still in the stores. That is being made across the San Francisco Bay, but I, I don't get involved in it. Nobody's ever called me and asked me a, an opinion or a question. <laughs> Did you take any vacations in those 22 years, like real vacations that you could clear your mind? Or did you always have these things spinning in your head? Well, they're always spinning, but no, no, no. We, we had on our boats, we would go up to the Yacht Club Island in the Delta for a couple of weeks every summer. My team was able to take care of that. And I was, you know, I had a telephone. Eventually we had cell phones that made it easy, but we had a couple international trips. My husband was determined that we were not going to sit around <laughs> just because you have business. <laughs> just because of quiche. <laughs> I wanted to drill down a little bit when you were talking about some of the pillars to success, the people and the product. And you clearly built a great team of people. So that's the one I'm going to start with. It's intuitive to know that you need great people around you. How did you find and recruit those people and then keep them with you? Yeah. Are you just, are you inherently just a really good manager? Oh, I'm a perfect manager. Of course. Of I'm. course you are. <laughs> <laughs> I made my mistakes too, and I learned from them, but I used headhunters. I interviewed carefully. I had to like the person, first of all. I had to feel some simpatico with the person and have them feel some simpatico with me because we're going to be working together. We have to respect one another. We have to care for one another. And they did with all of my people. So they liked me. They really did. You know, there's always some angst here and there, but I was a good manager. When you hire a good VP of marketing, you don't go in and tell her what to do or him what to do to do operations. If they come and ask your opinion, you can give it to them, but they then are the ones who pick up and do it. So it's not like I just let them go. We all talked about it, but I was not micromanaging my people. They could do that very well themselves. And everything was so fluid, so moving, so fast. Even the automation. Think of the computer automation that we went through during those times to yeah. manage our customers, to manage our financials and all that stuff. 
it was just more new stuff was always coming in. Did you run into any resistance being a female boss in the 70s, early 80s? I didn't. I didn't. If somebody didn't want to work for a woman, the headhunter wouldn't hear from them. But I worked at Syntex for five years before I had my children. That was 65 to 70. I was in the, a pharmaceutical chemist. I never felt any problem of being a woman at Syntex. I mean, you, if you look for something, you might find it. But I didn't look for it. I was just me. The same thing with Nancy's. You know, the reason I didn't have any problem with the glass ceiling is because I owned the ceiling. <laughs> there was nobody above me I had to placate. So I didn't have that problem. And I know many very successful CEOs and top people in large companies. And they get along because they're nice people. They're harmonious. They're not out to try to prove somebody did something wrong. I made my own way through all of this stuff. So in terms of the product, especially in the early days, you said initially, the very early days, you had taste tests with your friends and things like that. But as the company got going and you brought out the quiche Lorraine and the Florentine and things like that, how did you create the new product lines and decide which ways to go and what to pull back from? And did you ever put something out and then realize, oh, that's, that's really not going and we have to pull it back from the market? All of the above. So uh, first I did all of it. I remember perfecting the mushroom turnover here at my house. I hired somebody part-time to help build the quiche Lorraine because I didn't have time. I hired eventually our director of development and she had a small team and they worked on new kinds of appetizers. We had five or six by the time we were done, but nothing as strong as the petite quiche. We had a wonderful pecan tart. It was a butter sugar crust. And it was pecans and all that gooey, wonderful molasses flavor. Oh, it was so good. But, you know, it was a standalone product. We tried a couple other desserts, but they weren't the same. And it was an orphan, <laughs> the poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> we finally let that go. Mushroom turnovers are strong. And I was very high on this. We did a calzone, which was like a little crescent-shaped pizza dough filled with Italian stuffing, a sausage or whatever. Interesting thing was that calzone cost as much to make as the mushroom turnover, which is very fancy. We could get the price for mushroom turnover, but we couldn't get the price for the calzone because it was considered pizza, not worth it. Just didn't have the, uh, the cachet. It's, it's a tough business and the survivors, that's one reason you see products in and out of the club stores all the time. And I'm not speaking out of school. I mean, this is, this is just the way the industry is. It's a fabulous industry. It's been good for America because people can get really good products for less money. And why not? You know, everybody makes out. It's cheaper for the consumer. It's good for the, the manufacturer. And Costco makes out or the club store makes out as well. So it's, it's a wonderful system. How did it feel when you would walk into a store or the Price Club and see Nancy's specialty foods or Nancy's quiches on there? Did you sometimes get a little taken aback and think, wow, I, I did that? Oh, of course. Of course. And I'm always straightening it up and making sure the facings are proper. And oh, yeah, I love to tour the frozen food section even today, see what's there. But of course it was exciting. But, you know, you get over that pretty quickly. You just expect it's there. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it is, it is thrilling. Is there anything else you want to add that we haven't touched on? In terms of words of advice, I never said, how am I going to do this? I just started it. I was six years working hard, very hard, and almost had to close it down. So there's so many parts to this that have to come together right. You have to have the people, you have to have the product, you have to have the economics right. And I thought I did, but I really didn't. It took a wholesaler like Costco and Sam's to make it work for me. Trader Joe's was good too. That was a good account. But Safeway, you get into Safeway and the first thing they want is for you to buy an ad for $10,000. I mean, how many keys do you have to sell to make up $10,000? And that's the way the retail business is today. So 
if somebody's interested in doing something like this, learn about the business, talk to brokers, talk to buyers of these stores, talk to the, the buyers of your local grocery store and find out, get a sense of what the margins are. And if you were to do this, what do they think of the success? Of course, if I had asked that, I did take it to a broker in San Francisco, the top broker. And he kind of patted me on the head after I gave him my pitch and said, well, good luck, honey. You know, because he could not see the vision. I had the vision. He could not see the vision. He wasn't a woman. He wasn't doing cocktail parties. He didn't know that people need this really. And he thought of it as being a really small little dabbling thing. But I had to make it work. I had to do the distribution. I had to promote it. I had to take a chance with the club stores. I had to take a chance buying four and a half million dollars worth of equipment. That's what it takes to do it, to have the freezer and the oven and da, 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 all that stuff. But I had nobody saying, I'll buy enough quiche so you can pay for that. Uh-uh. I had to do that on faith. So, you know, you've got to- You have to have the stomach for some risk. Exactly. But if you feel in your gut that there's something wrong, listen to your gut. Because your gut tells you when you are hiding a problem or trying to solve a problem and it doesn't feel right, listen to it. It sounds like you listen to your gut all along. You listen to your gut initially. There's a hole in the marketplace that could be filled right. and I'm going to buck the naysayers. And then I'm also going to listen to my gut when something feels wrong. You really were true to yourself throughout this process, yeah. which isn't easy to do when there's a lot of voices coming in. That's right. It's so multidimensional, this business. It's the product, and then it's the managing the people, and then it's the manufacturing, and then it's the buildings and the distribution. And I mean, they had so much to learn and to manage. Yeah. And, you know, the retail food sector now is really pretty replete with almost anything you can think of. Back in 77, when I started this, there was a pigs in the blanket. There was an appetizer. But I didn't want to sort of pigs in the blanket, not with Julia Child sitting on my shelf. So I was upping that. I was enabling the consumer to have something better. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the hole in the market, not to do a better something, to try to make something new. If it's new, you have a better chance of success than if you're just doing something better than the other 10 products of the same sort on the shelf. Do something new and do it well and stick with it. And make sure the pricing is right. <laughs> Says the woman with experience and success. <laughs> Packaging, labor, benefits, a little profit, a little bit of profit. You should be getting 8 to 10% profit. Otherwise, your business is not viable because you have to reinvest. You have to buy new equipment. You have to grow. Was there ever a time in those 22 years that you thought, wow, I, I don't know that I can keep doing this. Like you said, you thought about it 24 hours a day. Did you ever just think, I've devoted my life to this and I just don't know if I can keep up at this pace or it's becoming too big or any number of things? No, it was only the threat of losing the customer. I would still be running it. I would have a ball. I had people helping me. As the president, I was reporting to me and I have to mention my late husband was very helpful to me up until 94 when we lost him. But he was a business school graduate. He was a venture capitalist. He knew how to start and run businesses. And I could not have done it without Glenn in those days. When I had a big problem, I would bring it to him. But, you know, in terms of running the company, I, he was running his companies. He had more work to do than he knew what to do. And so we were both kind of doing our own thing. But I always went to him with a problem. And he had good advice. He was fantastic. I was 55 when I sold the business. I could have gone on for another 20 years, except for the fact that I was worried about losing big parts of my business, which I know would have happened. That was the only reason I sold it was because of the threat. And then you did do something really fantastic and amazing after you sold it, which is you commissioned a yacht to be built and you sailed all around the world and went scuba diving and photographed things underwater, right? Yeah. What an amazing journey you've been on. Yeah. You know, Glenn and I were sailboat racers on San Francisco Bay in the seventies and eighties. And then we got a 40 foot power boat and then a 50 foot power boat. 
and we love the water. We love sailing and, and cruising. But in 1968, we went to Italy and Germany, and we walked along the quay in Portofino, and we saw all those enormous boats all backed into the quay, all with their flowers on the table in the back and the stewards out there and blah, blah, blah. And we had a dream of doing that. We talked about it, and we just had a dream of being able to someday do that. And this gave me the chance to do it. And even though I had lost Glenn, I basically designed the floor plan and a lot of the parts of the boat because I'd been on boats and I knew what I needed. And some things were different, more unusual, big full galley as a place where people could congregate and talk. And yes, we did a lot of diving and partying. I had 800 pillow tops over the 10 years that I had the vessel. It means 800 people slept on my pillows. <laughs> You really entertained a lot of friends. I had a ton of friends. So we had a wonderful, every time I'm with somebody who was on my boat, that's the first thing I talk about was that was so much fun. It was fantastic. I saw a lot of the world I never would have seen. I'm accused of having a lot of energy and I'm guilty. And <laughs> I get into something for a little bit. I go into it wholeheartedly. So that's the way I am and that's the way I like to be. Well, look at the results. The results speak for themselves. <laughs> it's so much fun. I'm having a great life. Got a long way to go. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Well, thank you. This has been really interesting for me, and I, I really appreciate your time. <laughs> it's just so fun to hear these stories. You know, I've eaten your products for years, <laughs> and it is true that they speak for themselves because my kids will be at a party and they'll say, can you grab like three or four more of those? I don't want them to go away. <laughs> So they're still popular. So I love hearing the stories behind the product. So thank you very much. I'm still amazed that Nancy's junior league assessment pointed her in the specific direction of manufacturing appetizers. And she took that and ran with it big time. I learned so much from talking with Nancy. Here are some of my takeaways from our conversation. Number one, listen to your gut. It tells you when you're hiding a problem or trying to solve a problem. Two, do your research, but don't always follow the advice other people give you. Others may not be able to see your vision the way you can. Three, surround yourself with great people and be good to them. Care for them, respect them, let them shine. Four, be a problem solver. Be willing to start over or look at something several different ways to make it work. Five, we're all going to make mistakes. If and how you allow yourself to learn from those mistakes determines how you move forward. And finally, number six, use good judgment. Kenny Rogers had it right. You got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them. And this isn't necessarily a takeaway, but it is the coolest sentence someone has said to me in a long time. So I just have to repeat Nancy's words. The reason I didn't have any problem with the glass ceiling is because I owned the ceiling. My big thanks to Nancy Mueller for inspiring us with her stories and her determination and for creating and owning her own glass ceiling. If you'd like to learn more about Nancy, please check out the show notes for this episode on our website, whatitsliketo.net. You can also find all of our past episodes there. If you like stories about female entrepreneurs, you may want to listen to episode 37 with Aishatu Fatima Dozier, the founder of Bossy Cosmetics, and episode 18 when Rebecca Firth talked about creating her own food blogging and cookbook enterprise. If you aren't already following us on social media, please do. And please tell a few friends about our podcast too. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar. Thanks for being curious about what it's like.